psychics. They claim to possess powers which enable them to move inanimate objects, bend metal with the light stroke of a finger, and assist police in their search for slain victims. This man has been acclaimed as the world's leading psychic. Danny Coram investigates those who claim to have psychic powers. Now you must consider the claims of psychic powers might be deceitful or even dangerous. Danny Coram, an alleged psychic in the first psychic confession. The newspapers and other media will often feature the exploits and claims of so-called psychics and they will rarely call those claims of power into question. I'm Danny Coram, and for the past 12 years I have been researching claims of psychic powers and presenting my findings in university lectures. Because of my expertise, a friend called and asked me to investigate a purported psychic who was influencing his brother. This program is about the shocking story that I found. It begins in Salt Lake City with a self-proclaimed psychic named James Heydrich. James Heydrich, martial arts instructor. Believed by many to be the world's leading psychic. Intellectually armed with a third grade education and claiming to be self-taught in the martial arts, one is easily impressed by Heydrich's exhibitions of strength. Cat-like agility. Power unleashed in a blow from only one inch. And the blind man's version of combat. Hydra claims he developed his abilities in adolescence and later perfected in manhood. Regardless of their size, Hydric could apparently move objects at will. When I arrived in Salt Lake, Hydric and his abilities were attracting extensive coverage by the local media. Earlier this month, a 21-year-old martial arts expert, now living in Salt Lake, walked into the Salt Lake Tribune and said, I can move objects without touching them. Reporters and editors, skeptics and believers together watched as James Heydrich did, in fact, move pencils, turn pages in a notebook, and flutter the leaves of a plant. A publisher in Chicago wants to market a book about Heydrich's life and some producers of national programs, including Johnny Carson, and that's incredible, have also expressed an interest in what he does. When I move a pencil, I don't think I do. Is it a magician's trick? Can he control his breathing like a ventriloquist and literally blow the objects away? Heydrich refutes his critics by turning sideways and moving the object. Sometimes he has others join him, using them as the instrument in moving the object. And you can, and when he does it, sometimes he'll say to touch him, and it's almost like you can feel an electricity, a, a force that's there that's, that you can't quite, it's like you tingle all over if you even go to touch him. The television exposure Heydrich received made his school of martial arts seem acceptable to parents like Steve and Sharon Clark, who Coram interviewed. The attitude, the way the man conducted himself, and the things that he did, so I told Jimmy that he could go ahead and enroll in the program. Heydrich's school enrolled over 300 students, but Heydrich had another goal. Get something like a monastery to where I can bring them up to where they all have this, have mental power. $16,000 of funding was provided by this woman, Janice Schrock, a divorcee who adopted Heydrich after she visited him at his studio. He was 22 years old. Yes. Did you think that might be an unusual relationship, adopting somebody that old? Yes, but I thought of it in the light of he wanted to go somewhere and he was interested in the monastery and I had connections in this respect and I thought that if he has made up his mind that that's what he wants to do, then 
I could help him in a lot of things. To aid the development of the monastery, she wanted Heydrich to visit a cult-like group in California. Swami Kriyananda, um, he has a, uh, a city in, it's at Nevada City, California. It's known as Ananda. It's a, uh, oh, I think he has about 150 families that live there. I want him to visit because he was interested in a monastery, but he wanted a monastery where he'd have children and families and such things. And this is what Swami Kriyananda has. Heydrich's influence quickly spread to other parts of the country. Appearances on primetime television and billed by the tabloids as the world's leading psychic, other more reliable sources such as the Associated Press stated, Heydrich has at various times and always in the presence of reporters done the following turn the pages of telephone books from 10 feet away and move at pens, pencils, plants and other objects by giving them hard stares. A scientist and professor of electrical engineering at the University of Utah, after much testing, also concluded that Heydrich's demonstrations of mind over matter were indeed authentic. Coram discovered that the Salt Lake police were also interested in Heydrich. Detective Clegg informed Coram that Heydrich had served time in Los Angeles for kidnapping and robbery, and he was considered dangerous by the Salt Lake police. James is quite, has quite a lot of ability. He's quite athletic, mm -hmm. and he could be quite dangerous. There were others who also knew of Heydrich's criminal record. Before you make any decisions, read about my life, and he gave me this folder of police records. John and Krista Bates took in the 21-year-old Heydrich after he moved to Salt Lake from Los Angeles. They believed they could help him overcome his past. And the whole night I was sitting up in the dining room and I was reading it and, you know, it didn't for some reason upset me at all. I just, I just felt like this boy needed some help and maybe for some reason I could be the one to help him. The Bates had met my friend's brother Steve, and John told me of Steve's harmful obsession with Heydrich's powers. You, James, to have some... Uh, connection with all of this uh, supernatural uh, stuff that was going on and Steve just lost contact with reality in essence and uh, for several days uh, they couldn't get him out of the hotel uh, he wouldn't eat, he wouldn't get dressed uh, and finally they <clears throat> were successful in getting him into the um, psychiatric clinic at the uh, university, UCLA but Heydrich's students were convinced that they too could possess the same psychic powers. Cause the building to crack, to rotate, cause that bag to react, cause the balls to move, cause the lights to move. Cause these things to start swinging, cause them to start swinging. That's good. Do you believe that James is a fake? He could be. It doesn't matter to me if he is or isn't. The devotion of cult members to their leaders has led to tragedy in the past. I don't accept the court. I don't accept the whole situation. You know, like I was in the desert minding my business. Charles Manson. This confusion belongs to you. It's your confusion. I don't have any confusion. I don't have any guilt. I know what I've done. His teachings and claims of power led his followers to bizarre acts of devotion and to murder. Jim Jones, a powerful speaker. He also used simple conjuring tricks to convince his followers that he possessed powers. He claimed the power to heal but tragically demonstrated that he could persuade hundreds to join him in death. Sadly, there seems to be no shortage of people willing to follow unquestionably someone who claims to have powers, especially if he promises them a share of that power. Allowing the mind to overpower the body, the mind wills and the body behaves. Coram had reason to suspect that Heydrich could also become a persuasive cult figure. And you can tear up about 15, 20 people at one time with these. And because of the holes are in them, it makes it so where it moves move quick, faster. No resistance. Yeah. And After lengthy discussions, Coram convinced his friend's brother Steve to end his relationship with Heydrich. 
when Steve was no longer under Heydrich's influence, Horam decided to film Heydrich. I asked Heydrich if I could film him for a program dealing with alleged psychics. Although he agreed, I remained cautious. We have outside and inside training quarters. And what I'll do is, without my students even knowing it, I will take, take them downtown and have them attacked. A criminal record and lethal weapons. Heydrich had to be approached with great care. And break the wrist. If it's used right, it can come and take the arm around your, the body and break it. There was no doubt in Coram's mind that Heydrich was a threat. But even more alarming, a negative influence on others and his powers. Are they psychic? James Heydrich, lethal prowess. Coupled with the ability to convince others of hidden powers and seemingly transfer his psychic abilities to his followers. But of all of Heydrich's demonstrations, this was the most impressive. Here, Heydrich causes a dollar bill to rotate at will on the head of a pin, even though it is sealed off from air currents and threads by a glass fish tank. Observant, Coram was uniquely qualified to discern if trickery was used. A world-class inventor of conjuring tricks, Danny Coram is a professional magician. With over 20 years invested in the mastering of his craft, Coram has developed the surgeon-like skill necessary to manipulate matter without regard for the laws of science. Or logic. The author and publisher of numerous texts for magicians, Coram specializes in a style of conjuring using borrowed objects and with his audience only a few inches away. You have a five dollar bill? I just happen to have one right here just with me. In his office, Coram displays his skill for a television interview. Show both sides. Nothing else in this. By the way, I pulled back my sleeve so you would know there's nothing up my sleeves, right? Certainly. You fold the bill in half once like this. You fold it in half again like this. Fold it in half again one more time. Now, don't take your eyes off the five. Lisa, I'll make you laugh. I'll make you cry. You've just kissed four bucks. Goodbye. Most people think I deceive them because my hands are quicker than the eye. Here you can see the same trick, but in slow motion. And it is still impossible to perceive how the trick is done. The principles of our craft have become so sophisticated that if Houdini were alive today, he too would be fooled by the tricks of the modern-day magician. In his book, The Fakers, Coram summarizes his investigations of alleged psychics and it provides the basis for his university program, Fraud and the Supernatural, in which Coram presents many demonstrations which might easily be interpreted as psychic powers. Here, Coram has invited five people to join him on stage. Four of the participants are asked to write down the name of someone they know. This participant is asked to write down the name of a deceased person she knew. Now, wait until my back is turned before you begin writing on your slips of paper and then fold your slip of paper after you've written the name. Coram has never met any of these people before. The names are then folded, mixed, and given to the person on the end. The woman standing next to Coram is a registered nurse, taking his pulse. What I'd like you to do, ma'am, no, continue holding my pulse, is I'd like you to take up one of the slips of paper and hold it up to your forehead. Okay? If you notice any change in my pulse, let me know immediately. How's my pulse? Is it faster or slower? It's the regular pulse. About the, about the same rate? Okay. Would you please put that piece of paper down and pick up another one? How's my pulse? It's the same. It's not slowed down at all? No. All right, put that one down, pick up another one. How's my pulse? Fine, the same. Without warning, Coram's pulse stops. It stopped. I'm sorry? 
It stopped. I have no pulse. My pulse has stopped? Yeah. There is no pulse? You're holding the name of the deceased. Let me have it. Do not open it. Hold it pressed tightly against your head. I want you to look at me. This is a gentleman, wasn't it, that you knew very well? It was a friend. And his name is Bruce Prather. Yes. Although his audience is thoroughly entertained, many believe that what they have witnessed is not a magician's trick. Now, how many here, after seeing this last demonstration, might believe that I have some kind of a psychic power? Let me see a show of hands, please. But his audience is reassured. Everything that you saw this evening, everything was a trick. Psychic powers or cleverly concealed tricks. After several demonstrations, Coram was convinced that Heydrich was not a psychic, but a trickster employing brilliantly conceived stratagems of deception. Retreating to Dallas, Coram worked to duplicate Heydrich's methods. I believed Heydrich used a refined technique of exhaling puffs of air which caused the pencil to rotate. To accomplish this, the pencil must first be balanced on the edge of the table. Then, a puff of air is exhaled, not at the pencil, but at the table's surface. The air currents moving along the surface contact the delicately balanced pencil. To spin the pencil in the opposite direction, a puff of air is directed at the other end of the pencil. Duplicating Heydrich's head turn was far more difficult. With proper timing, I believe the head could be turned before the air currents reach the pencil. And with practice, success. The turning page was also accomplished by the same principle. If you release the puff of air at the tabletop, a page with an upturned edge flips over. I also experimented with a method where air currents were not involved. In this method, which cannot be disclosed, the page slowly turns. Illusion extraordinaire. But this was Coram's toughest challenge. Motion in a dollar bill. Sealed from trickery. My immediate thought was that Heydrich used a cleverly concealed device. But after examining the props, I ruled this out. I noticed, however, that the bill only revolved when Heydrich was at one end of the tank so I had one of my crew divert Hydric out of the room. As I anticipated, my airline ticket and credit card easily slid unhindered beneath the tank's edge. The doorway for Hydric's air currents, a narrow gap between the tank and the table. Hydric took advantage of the unobvious. Most fish tanks, due to imperfections, will not meet a table flush on all edges. Thus, the seal is imperfect. As in the pencil trick, Coram discovered that gentle puffs of air directed at the table's surface will carry under the tank's edge and hit the dollar bill, setting it in motion. Few magicians have ever taken such a simple and obvious principle and yet made it so deceptive. To be certain that Heydrich would not refute his explanations, Coram filmed each of Heydrich's demonstrations in Salt Lake City with restrictions. A strategically placed and highly sensitive microphone thwarted the pencil illusion. We knew that Hydric was afraid that our microphone could pick up his blowing. I'm going to need music, I'll bet. You think so? Yeah, I just can't, I can't. Uh, it's too quiet. He wanted music to cover his blowing. When Coram refused, failure. The dollar bill trick, foiled by securing tape along the tank's edge, and again, failure. The next day, Coram and Heydrich flew to Dallas for another taping session. On this day, Coram removed his previous restrictions. I told the sound technician to inform us that the mic levels had to be turned down due to feedback. We had a problem with the audio. We'll have to do it over again. All right. With the mic obstacle eliminated, the pencils moved. 
Later, Heydrich attempted to transfer his pretended power through Coram. But unbeknownst to Heydrich, Coram blew on the pencil first. Heydrich was startled. For the dollar bill test, Coram supplied a tank where only one corner would not meet the table flush. This corner was turned away from Heydrich. The dollar bill remained motionless. The glass is so hard to work through us at times. How, how about if we turn it? Maybe, would that help you? Yeah. Turn yeah, it. It doesn't matter. It's still... With the corner now accessible, movement. And when Heydrich again pretended to transfer his power through Coram, trying to get to go back the other way, Coram brought the bill to life. Never knowing that Coram was a professional magician, Heydrich was again bewildered. We already done it twice. Yeah, but just this thing, right? Something's not right. What? I don't know. It's gonna look. It's gonna look good from here. Cut off film. No, do you think that we're gonna do something with it? At a later taping. Is that what you're saying? It's uh, not right. Heydrich is reluctant to demonstrate the page-turning trick. I don't want to do it. I don't. Forget the part. He becomes that increasingly that. agitated. Because this, I don't, I don't understand, man. This ain't cool at all. And finally, explodes. God. Makes me mad every Heydrich time. and his claims of power were a destructive force, but what later surfaced was an even greater threat. How did they want to use you to brainwash people? I could have went two ways, good or bad. After several hours of tense and exhaustive dialogue, Coram was able to persuade Heydrich to talk about his past. Coram then enlisted the help of Hugh Ainsworth, a former bureau chief for Newsweek, to verify the details of Heydrich's past. The taping lasted two and a half hours and revealed not only trickery, but a life of tragedy and fantasy. The real legend of James Heydrich. Tell us, James, who you really are. It, well, it's not, a lot I don't remember because, you know, I've suffered a lot of head injury from my father and a lot of it just, well, I try to remember it and it hurts, you know, I have uh, mentally a lot of these things that does a lot of damage to me. Hurt you inside? Yeah, and I can't really talk about some. But you see, like, there were times when I would uh, try to, uh, you know, work things out with them. I try to please her, and she just—I don't know. Just awful things. And what's the question again? Heydrich at first is hesitant. But like my parents would lock me in a closet and they'd lock the door so I couldn't come out because I was supposed to embarrass them. In that closet, I'd close my eyes and I was actually picture things coming up. I'd picture myself being in a big, huge house or mansion, monastery in China somewhere, and. Uh, it's I actually, it seems like something like astral projection. It seems like I was actually there. I could actually physically hear things taking place. I might go into the sand, hear a dong, boom. And then when I'd appear, everybody would bow to me, and I'd be welcome to come in. Lock and dam on the Savannah River, where Heydrich's youthful fantasies extended beyond a locked closet. He tells of an imaginary Chinese mentor who taught him secret powers. Uh, that's where I met Master Wu. I've never seen a Chinese man before. So I looked and there's this little old Chinese man, I guess about five foot four. He would say, he says, to you in my eyes, I see a, a new, uh, a strange animal in a new land. Like he would say, uh, come with me and teach you I will of this jungle. Don't be smart, man. Just sit back there and take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Heydrich's mother, Lois, a 37-year-old house painter. At the age of 18, she deserted Heydrich when only three years old. I mean, when I left Philly, I left him with all four youngins. Yeah. But Billy was a wife, Peter. I was 15 years old, he was 30. Yeah. I wasn't nothing but a kid. I didn't know nothing. Mm -hmm. By the time I was 21, I had four kids. So... When you were a young boy and, and you were beaten and you were shoved aside and mistreated, you, you started a fantasy world of your own. Well, see what happened. A lot of my pain, like I'd get pain, like in fact, I got scars all over my stomach when I was young. I'd think about going to the moon. 
And I remember when uh, my dad, he'd take and he'd tie me to a barrel so I couldn't run or, or he'd, and he'd take a, you ever seen those little ping pong balls? He'd take two of those things, stick them in my mouth and, and tie my head and he'd whoop me so I couldn't holler loud because he'd be drunk. And, and see what I think is about laying my head down and just I would imagine rolling and going up to the moon. And by the time I got back, the beating's over. When his mother left, Heydrich's father later remarried. She recalls abuse from Heydrich's stepmother, Mary. But see, Mary, she didn't lot my kids anyways. Well, they was mine, you know, mine and Billy. <coughs> and so Mary got mad at him one day. They done something they weren't supposed to. So uh, Mary tied him out in the yard to the tree. Well, it happened to be the same tree that the dog was tied to. So when it comes supper time, Mary wouldn't feed him. So Billy come home, he said, well, what'd they do? Mary said, they'd misbehave, and I just tied them out there. We couldn't eat in the house because we were dogs. We were her pet dogs. In fact, we, I, I mean, my, my name was uh, Spot because I had, I had chicken pops. They used to call me Spot. Cause I, and they wouldn't let Spot in the house. James said that they called him Spot because they wouldn't feed him inside, they'd feed him outside. Is that true? That's true. Yeah, I'd like to say, but it's true. Is there any truth to any of that? Heydrich's father, Billy, a former convict who served on a chain gang when Heydrich was an infant. Well, my wife always tried to treat him right. Because, you know, when broken up families and I married again, why well, they always, they don't like her. Or she mm. don't like them sometimes, the way they act. She's tried to be nice. Bobby Jean Ward, Heydrich's aunt, reluctantly recalls abuse. Can you tell us just how bad was the abuse that James suffered? Well, at one time, when they were staying with me, uh, he was crying in the middle of the night. And his mother got up and she took a rick rat paddle. And the end that you hold in your hand, she took it and put it up his rectum. I don't hit beat. You asked, now wait a minute. You asked, you asked Adam if his mom ever beat on him. Now he'll tell you his mom put him in a tub of cold water one morning. But beat on that youngin? No. I was working these honky tonks with a bouncer. So I bounced for 12 or 15 years. What was the one thing that you can remember the most about James? Well, when I was working them honky-tonks and couldn't get nobody to stay with him, I kept him in the car there a lot of time. He'd Otherwise, stay in the car while you went to work? Sleep, at night. sleep back there, had a station wagon. Heydrich was then shuffled to different foster homes. Later, at the age of nine, he was committed to Witten Center, an institution for the mentally retarded. I went to Witten Village and talked with him. That's another point I wanted to ask you. What was he doing? At, why was he at Whitten Village? He wasn't retarded, was he? No, he wasn't retarded. And uh, the welfare people done that on their own. Now, I didn't have nothing to do with it. Why, why did they do that? No, I don't know. Well, was he in some trouble at that point, or was he in and out of trouble? Well, they said he couldn't handle him. He was too active. Was it tough at Whitten Village? I mean, was it pretty rough? Well, they said they had to give him some tranquilizers to calm him down. Tragically, the nine-year-old Heydrich was not mentally retarded, as confirmed by his social worker at Witten Center, Hilda Carter. Well, at one time, Witten Center was um, not only an institution for the mentally retarded, but also took children who had nowhere else to go. Aiken, South Carolina. Heydrich lived here in several foster homes after his release from Witten Center at the age of 16. I think James' history will show you that a lot of... Uh, Help came from various church groups that would rally to the cause of taking the boy in. In fact, Frank Gallardi, the crime prevention officer in Aiken who worked with the rebellious teenager. I just think that he's no different from any other young man. And like adults, if there's a, a lack of love shown and you're not wanted, you strike out. And I think in this case, this is what's happened to this young man. He never had anybody that really sh showed him any love. What, what would you do differently? Anything at all? Is there anything you could have done? differently stayed with their father 
Would you do that if you had a chance? God, that would give me the crown. I would have. Yeah. I'd have stayed with their father. He was a good father. He was a good husband. He just happened to be a wife beater. At age 17, Heydrich hitchhikes to California, away from Aiken and his scarred past. But he was always sort of a showman. The first time I saw him, he was wearing sort of a Batman uniform or something of the sort with a flowing cape. And uh, uh, he usually wore something like that to attract attention, to make him a little bit different. Chester Cromwell was Heydrich's last foster parent in Aiken. He received several letters from the adventure-bound youth. Chester, he sent you a letter. What did it say in the letter? He said it was an unusual letter. <laughs> well, uh, he has sent me several letters, but one of them was that he was doing some movies or something as a star of Kung Fu. He was the new Bruce Lee. Heydrich was never the star he claimed to be. Instead, it was here at the Los Angeles County Jail where Heydrich was incarcerated for three and a half years for kidnapping and robbery. And where he was first exposed to the world of the cults. Intrigued, Heydrich studied these cultic writings of Muharrem Korbegovich, the alphabet bomber, convicted of bombing the Los Angeles International Airport. As the taping continued, Coram learned much more about the relationship between Heydrich's claims of power and his aspirations. Do you feel bad because you uh, no, because tricked I, them? No, I don't feel bad at all. Because, one, I, I, it'd be different if you tricked them and then wrong. But I tricked them for the good. To eliminate any future threat, Coram believed Heydrich must reveal not only his past, but how and why he used his claims of power. Because of Coram's persistence, what you are about to see and hear is the first confession of a leading psychic. Heydrich begins by telling of his fascination with magic and magicians at the age of nine. And he'd show how easy it is to trick people. And uh, you stand and you talk to the person, and all of a sudden he'd move his hands around, and he'd throw the paper over the guy's head. And everybody in the audience is laughing, and, and, and this guy's going, now what are they laughing at? And he opened his hand, the guy goes like that. And, and it's just a sleight of hand, the guy's paying attention to the hand movement, and actually you're throwing the paper over his head. Things like that impressed me, how, how uh, close-minded a lot of people were. I mean, they, they, it's so fascinating to see how people would just miss things just like that. The obvious things that miss. You know, we have something in common. We both learned our first trick at nine years old, but I could read and write and I had somebody to teach me. How did you learn? I mean, you couldn't even read and write. And my, I, basically, I'd, I'd con my teachers into reading to me. <laughs> how did you do that? Just, I guess I'd have that little sweet voice that I could just do that. And Miss King used to read for me. She's a real good teacher. Her name's Miss King. And, and she used to read for me, and, and I just sat back and think with, you know, Harry Houdini. You got these, all these magicians who make rabbits disappear, and Harry Houdini makes an elephant disappear. And, the, and like, there's ways that I would think back, and I, I'm trying to use the obvious thing, and, and it, I was right. Harry Houdini, would, he'd have a box, and from the audience, he'd have someone look into a box. Except it looks like it's, it's you know, a triangle. But it's not. It's just like this, and then it's got another piece here. And actually, when it closes the curtains, it turns. So the elephant's actually behind. And he would make, you know, it's something I'd figure out, and it was right. And then I'd figure, well, geez, if, he, if people go crazy over that, maybe I should do something people go crazy over. But then I didn't. But Heydrich presented his like tricks as powers. Why did you feel that you had to tell them that you had powers that you didn't have? Because I, I wanted attention. My parents would never give it to me. I'd never, I would always be ignored or kicked around, and I had to do this and, uh, to make me feel good. It gave me confidence. Every time someone thought what I did was very good, but I'd never tell them what it was. I'd tell them it's something else, because if I tell them what it was, it's, oh, fine, it's just a trick. But I always tell them it's something else, so that I continued to get a recognition. Heydrich uh, received his recognition on national television. You were on That's Incredible a few months ago, and you really tricked them. Hmm? Tricked the whole world. 
you tricked them really good. I, do you remember uh, how impressed they were with you? What does it make you feel like? I did that to reach. It's like a hand reaching out for uh, recognition so that I can uh, later... I don't know. I just, I just wanted to be known. I needed to be recognized. All my life I've been... And I hate keeping to go back to the past. I hate to, I hate to keep going back, but I don't know. I wanted to do that because it was different. And I, I knew, I just wanted to see how open-minded people were. I wanted to see if these people were so-called intelligent and I was so-called dumb. I mean, I, surely I'm here for a reason. My, I, my whole idea behind this in the first place was to see how dumb America was, how dumb the world is. Heydrich, admitting that Coram had outwitted him, eventually agreed to demonstrate his technique. Years of practices over and over again, to where if you can show, like if I stand here and I say, okay, I'm going to move this lead, people's looking and they're waiting, so the lead moves, okay? It did move, okay? Actually, it didn't move from power, it moved from something else, physical. But the can people in the audience, what? it's moved from air currents. From where? From my mouth. But you can't tell it. See, it takes so many years of practice and getting it down pat <laughs> to where you can't see it, you see? And I have to say that, too. Matter of fact, yeah. what you did, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, you would take somebody and hold their hand and you tell them to point at the leaf and you'd say, now you will make the leaf move. Right, and they believe they make it. See, it's who called power of suggestion. Once you get a person to actually believe he can do something, then he, perhaps he can do it. What did you do, though, when you I, would hold what their I hand? Do, this is can, not, you, can you show yeah, right now? All right, okay. let me explain what I'm doing. First of all, I'm not, I'm not going like that because that can be seen. I am taking air from inside and causing it to come out in a way to where nothing here shows. And if you can get the camera on my face, and you see this leaf, it moves, but my, nothing here moves, you see. And what I'd do is I'd, I'd grab the hand, and I'd, I'd do like this, see. And I'd already, it's already moved, because I can direct it in a way to where it's, wow, it's hit on right, every time. And my practice, you know, I spent a year and six months in solitary confinement, and all this time I've been thinking and thinking, and I said, that's it. This and you could take all the time you wanted to learn right. how to breathe and make right. it move. And I had, I'd spent hours and hours and hold my breath and breathing, different breathing controls, different things. So many ways that, I mean, I could, I could make deputies think someone touched them on their, their neck or something because I could breathe in a way and I'd be looking over here and they'd, they'd feel something and I'd say, that's a ghost. And they'd <laughs> right on the floor. <laughs> they'd go running out of the place. <laughs> And it's, it's something that was fascinating to me, and it got me recognition. I mean, every deputy in that jail was so frightened. <laughs> that guy's so possessed. Yeah. I remember when I was in, in, in Chaplin's office. Chaplin, you know, While in jail, Heydrich was taught by a chaplain to read and write. Although he exaggerates, Heydrich tells how he used his tricks to convert inmates. How do you convert people? How do you get them to go from bad to good? And he would tell me, well, you got to turn them on to, the, to Jesus, the Lord. And so what I did is like, he gave me a Bible, several Bibles, and I'd read them, you see. So I said, hmm, I got an idea. So I didn't tell Brother Gerald this, and I haven't never told him this, but I would convert 20 inmates a day. I would make that my limit. I have to do 20 inmates a day. And what I'd do is I'd get up and I'd start telling them about Jesus and stuff, and I'd read things, and they'd get interested. And then when I see that they're starting to get turned off, I says, hey, check this out, man. You don't believe it exists? I'll show you. <laughs> it's so funny. These guys' eyes, mmm. What did you do? I'd take, and I'd put, I'd take the pages of the Bible, and I'd say, if the Lord is here with me, make these pages move. What, and you'd open the pages? Of the I'd open the Bible, and I'd say, hold the Bible or something, and I'd say, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, make these pages move. The guy's going, uh-oh. You know, every time it worked. And then I'd say, it's in you. And I'd take a pencil and I'd put it there and I'd say, i, I got to call the Lord and see if I can get him to do this. But you are going to have the power to do this if you accept the Lord. And the next thing, you know, you see this guy wearing a big cross and passing Bibles out to people. Before. When in Egypt, performing for family members of the late Anwar Sadat, Heydrich relates how he healed a woman stricken by a heart attack. She strongly believed that I could actually heal her and she came right up. What did you do that made her believe that? by moving things and I would show her so many things and see I would touch her and she'd actually feel weird things 
but it's only in her mind. She wanted to feel these things. Do you feel bad because you uh, no because I them? no I don't feel bad at all because one I, I it'd be different if you tricked them and then wrong, but I tricked them for the good. Were adults fooled by what you did as well as children? Absolutely. In fact, there was more adults fooled by children. Than Why? Because an adult, a lot of the adults are looking for something like this. They want to see something like this exist. Dr. Ray Hyman, a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon and an expert on deception. He is noted for his work with the Defense Department exposing fraudulent psychics. He maintains that anyone can be deceived, such as the scientists who tested Heydrich. Then we are fooled not because we are mentally incompetent or gullible, but rather because we are intelligent, correct? Yes, and I, I'm glad you brought use the word gullible because there's a an illusion called the illusion of invulnerability or the not me syndrome. And when we see someone else being taken in, someone taken in by Heydrich, for example, if someone may watch this and say, gee, how gullible those people are to be taken in by something like that. And they say, that couldn't happen to me. Those people are gullible. And the very phrase of saying that person is gullible is a device, a psychological device to say, he's different from me. There's something wrong with that fellow. I couldn't fall for that. And unfortunately, that, to the extent that people really believe that they're different from other people who are being taken in, that it makes me even more susceptible to being taken in. In fact, if I were a con man, that's the kind of person I want to deal with. The only way to avoid being deceived, Danny, if you think about it, is to create a situation that's intolerable. We couldn't live with it. You have to trust to some extent. To, you have to trust your own intuitions at some times. You have to trust other people. Do you think that parents watching this particular program might think that what you were trying to start was a cult? Uh, cult. Yes. You say that you did not want to start a cult. No. Now, you know that you can't read and write right. and that you lack education. Right. Do you think the possibility existed that somebody could have used you to start a cult? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Kabrigovich, King Maharian Kabrigovich, who is the he? alphabet bomber who blew up the airport in LA. Uh, he, he, I, he wanted to use me for an occult. Have Sirhan Sirhan, who was part of the occult. It's called Aliens of America, the AOA. And these people wanted to use me as a, a leader of their cult. How, let me ask you, how did they want to use you? To brainwash people. By, in other words... By showing them this power and saying that this power came from something that it didn't. You know, Jim Jones um, was of that type. Uh, he used tricks to enhance his uh, image with his... Um, he did conjuring type tricks? He did, he did magic tricks, yes, and he did some other kinds of cons. He actually had some people... Uh, pretend that they were sick so, so he could cure them. Uh, he stood to uh, all these things as a way of enhancing his powers. So then a purported psychic could be used to form a cult? Oh yes, no question about it. Absolutely, like with uh, the Jim Jones incident. That, had never, that would have never taken place if people's mind would have been open. That would have been stopped. The thing with Sir Hanster... Yeah, I when you say people's minds, are you talking about the people in his group or people in the country. The country. Two days after Heydrich's confession, he was arrested for receiving stolen guns. Coram visited Heydrich in jail several weeks after his arrest. I came to see Heydrich as I was told he tried to hang himself the night before. I had the rope under my jaw here where it would rest there and I had my head turned, you know, and I would lift up off my tiptoes and I'd turn a little bit where it looked like I was hang hanging. It was really funny. I don't think it was worth it now. I mean, it threw me in a cell with no clothes on and I like to froze. But <laughs> it was funny for a while. See, so it was just another trick? Just something past time. I mean, you see, I'm 22 years old, but I've only been living in the world, outside world, for two years, if that. So I, I'm not really 22. Fantasy and deception. Now exposure and confinement. James Heydrich, his world of illusion shattered by reality.
Heydrich's arrest confirmed my initial fears that he might be a negative influence on young people whom he attracted with his claims of power. The reason for his arrest was that he received several stolen guns from three teenage students who were members of his studio. Because of my training as a magician, it's very easy for me to understand how each of us can be deceived. But I couldn't expose James Heydrich with vindictiveness because of his tragic background. After the attempted assassination on President Reagan, a purported psychic, Tamara Rand, had claimed she had predicted the assassination attempt. Her prediction later turned out to be nothing more than a cruel hoax. Now, as a magician, I tell my audience that everything that I do is a trick. The Tamara Rands and James Hydricks, however, play in our fantasies and try and turn them into their own distorted realities. The Charles Manson and Jim Jones reality were life-destroying. So when you hear of someone claiming to have psychic or supernatural powers, just be cautious. Until the next time, I'm Danny Corum, and thank you for joining us.